Chapter Sixteen of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eric Metzler. Rouge et Noir. It has been indicated that disaffection followed the elevation of Losada to the presidency. This feeling continued to grow. Throughout the entire republic there seemed to be a spirit of silent, sullen discontent. Even the old liberal party to which Goodwin, Zavala, and other patriots had lent their aid was disappointed. Losada had failed to become a popular idol. Fresh taxes, fresh import duties, and, more than all, his tolerance of the outrageous oppression of citizens by the military had rendered him the most obnoxious president since the despicable Alforan. The majority of his own cabinet were out of sympathy with him. The army, which he had courted by giving it license to tyrannize, had been his main and thus far adequate support. But the most impolitic of the administration's moves had been when it antagonized the Vesuvius Fruit Company, an organization plying twelve steamers, and with a cash capital somewhat larger than Anchuria's surplus and debt combined. Reasonably, an established concern like the Vesuvius would become irritated at having a small retail republic with no rating at all attempt to squeeze it. So when the government proxies applied for a subsidy they encountered a polite refusal. The president at once retaliated by clapping an export duty of one real per bunch on bananas, a thing unprecedented in fruit-growing countries. The Vesuvius Company had invested large sums in wharves and plantations along the Anchurian coast. Their agents had erected fine homes in the towns where they had their headquarters, and heretofore had worked with the Republic in goodwill and with advantage to both. It would lose an immense sum if compelled to move out. The selling price of bananas from Veracruz to Trinidad was three reals per bunch. This new duty of one real would have ruined the fruit growers in Anchuria and have seriously discommoded the Vesuvius Company had it declined to pay it. But for some reason the Vesuvius continued to buy Anchurian fruit, paying four reals for it, and not suffering the growers to bear the loss. This apparent victory deceived His Excellency and he began to hunger for more of it. He sent an emissary to request a conference with a representative of the fruit company. The Vesuvius sent Mr. Franzoni, a little, stout, cheerful man, always cool, and whistling airs from Verdi's operas. Signor Spirition, of the office of the Minister of Finance, attempted the sandbagging in behalf of Anchuria. The meeting took place in the cabin of the Salvador, of the Vesuvius line, Signor Espiritión opened negotiations by announcing that the government contemplated the building of a railroad to skirt the alluvial coastlands. After touching upon the benefit such a road would confer upon the interests of the Vesuvius, he reached the definite suggestion that a contribution to the road's expenses of, say, fifty thousand pesos would not be more than an equivalent to benefits received. Mr. Franzoni denied that his company would receive any benefits from a contemplated road. As its representative, he must decline to contribute fifty thousand pesos, but he would assume the responsibility of offering twenty-five. Did Signor Espiritión understand Signor Franzoni to mean twenty-five thousand pesos? By no means. Twenty-five pesos. And in silver, not in gold. Your offer insults my government, cried Signor Espiritión, rising with indignation. Then, said Mr. Franzoni, in warning tone, we will change it. The offer was never changed. Could Mr. Franzoni have meant the government? This was the state of affairs in Anchuria when the winter season opened at Coralio at the end of the second year of Losada's administration. So when the government and society made its annual exodus to the seashore, it was evident that the presidential advent would not be celebrated by unlimited rejoicing. The 10th of November was the day set for the entrance into Coralio of the gay company from the capital. A narrow-gauge railroad runs twenty miles into the interior from Solitas. The government party travels by carriage from San Mateo to this road's terminal point, and proceeds by train to Solitas. From here they march in grand procession to Coralio, where, on the day of their coming, festivities and ceremonies abound. But this season saw an ominous dawning of the 10th of November. Although the rainy season was over, the day seemed to hark back to reeking June. A fine drizzle of rain fell all during the forenoon. The procession entered Coralio amid a strange silence. 
President Losada was an elderly man, grizzly bearded, with a considerable ratio of Indian blood revealed in his cinnamon complexion. His carriage headed the procession, surrounded and guarded by Captain Cruz and his famous troop of one hundred light horse, El Ciento Huyando. Colonel Rocas followed, with a regiment of the regular army. The President's sharp, beady eyes glanced about him for the expected demonstration of welcome, but he faced a stolid, indifferent array of citizens. Sightseers, the Anchurians, are by birth and habit, and they turned out to their last able-bodied unit to witness the scene, but they maintained an accusive silence. They crowded the streets to the very wheel-ruts, they covered the red tile roofs to the eaves, but there was never a viva from them. No wreaths of palm and lemon branches or gorgeous strings of paper roses hung from the windows and balconies as was the custom. There was an apathy, a dull dissenting disapprobation, that was the more ominous because it puzzled. No one feared an outburst, a revolt of the discontents, for they had no leader. The President and those loyal to him had never even heard whispered a name among them capable of crystallizing the dissatisfaction into opposition. No, there could be no danger. The people always procured a new idol before they destroyed an old one. At length, after a prodigious galloping and curvetting of red-sashed majors, gold-laced colonels and epauletted generals, the procession formed for its annual progress down the Calle Grande to the Casa Morena, where the ceremony of welcome to the visiting president always took place. The Swiss band led the line of march. After it pranced the local commandante, mounted, and with a detachment of his troops. Next came a carriage with four members of the cabinet, conspicuous among them the minister of war, old General Pilar, with his white moustache and his soldierly bearing. Then the president's vehicle, containing also the ministers of finance and state, and surrounded by Captain Cruz's light horse formed in a close double file of fours. Following them the rest of the officials of state, the judges and distinguished military and social ornaments of public and private life. As the band struck up, and the movement began, like a bird of ill omen, the Valhalla, the swiftest steamship of the Vesuvius line, glided into the harbor in plain view of the President and his train. Of course there was nothing menacing about its arrival. A business firm does not go to war with a nation. But it reminded Senor Espirition and others in those carriages that the Vesuvius Fruit Company was undoubtedly carrying something up its sleeve for them. By the time the van of the procession had reached the government building, Captain Cronin of the Valhalla and Mr. Vincenti, member of the Vesuvius Company, had landed and were pushing their way, bluff, hearty, and nonchalant, through the crowd on the narrow sidewalk, clad in white linen, big, debonair, with an air of good-humoured authority. They made conspicuous figures among the dark mass of unimposing Anchurians, as they penetrated to within a few yards of the steps of the Casa Morena. Looking easily above the heads of the crowd, they perceived another that towered above the undersized natives. It was the fiery pole of Dicky Maloney against the wall close by the lower step, and his broad, seductive grin showed that he recognized their presence. Dicky had attired himself becomingly for the festive occasion in a well-fitting black suit. Pasa was close by his side, her head covered with the ubiquitous black mantilla. Mr. Vincenti looked at her attentively. Botticelli's Madonna, he remarked gravely. I wonder when she got into the game. I don't like his getting tangled with the women. I hoped he would keep away from them. Captain Cronin's laugh almost drew attention from the parade. With that head of hair, keep away from the women, and a Maloney? Hasn't he got a license? But, nonsense aside, what do you think of the prospects? It's a species of filibustering out of my line. Vincenti glanced again at Dickie's head and smiled. Rouge et noir, he said. There you have it. Make your play, gentlemen. Our money is on the red. The lad's game said Cronin, with a commanding look at the tall, easy figure by the steps. But tis all like fly-by-night theatricals to me. The talk's bigger than the stage. There's a smell of gasoline in the air, and they're their own audience and scene-shifters. They ceased talking, for General Pilar had descended from the first carriage and had taken his stand upon the top step of Casa Morena. 
as the oldest member of the cabinet custom had decreed that he should make the address of welcome presenting the keys of the official residence to the president at its close general pilar was one of the most distinguished citizens of the republic he wrote three wars and innumerable revolutions he was an honored guest at european courts and camps an eloquent speaker and a friend to the people he represented the highest type of the anchurians holding in his hand the gilt keys of casa morena he began his address in a historical form touching upon each administration and the advance of civilization and prosperity from the first dim striving after liberty down to present times arriving at the regime of president lozada at which point according to precedent he should have delivered a eulogy upon its wise conduct and the happiness of the people general pilar paused then he silently held up the bunch of keys high above his head with his eyes closely regarding it the ribbon with which they were bound fluttered in the breeze it still blows cried the speaker exultantly citizens of anchuria give thanks to the saints this night that our air is still free thus disposing of losada's administration he abruptly reverted to that of olivara anchuria's most popular ruler olivara had been assassinated nine years before while in the prime of life and usefulness a faction of the liberal party led by losada himself had been accused of the deed whether guilty or not it was eight years before the ambitious and scheming losada had gained his goal upon this theme general pilar's eloquence was loosed he drew the picture of the beneficent olivara with a loving hand he reminded the people of the peace the security and the happiness they had enjoyed during that period he recalled in vivid detail and with significant contrast the last winter sojourn of president olivara in corralio when his appearance at their fiestas was the signal for thundering vivas of love and approbation the first public expression of sentiment from the people that day followed a low sustained murmur went among them like the surf rolling along the shore ten dollars to a dinner at the st charles remarked mr vincenti that rouge wins i never bet against my own interests said captain cronin lighting a cigar long-winded old boy for his age what's he talking about my spanish replied vincenti runs about ten words to the minute his is something around two hundred whatever he's saying he's getting them warmed up friends and brothers general pilar was saying could i reach out my hand this day across the lamentable silence of the grave to olivara the good to the ruler who was one of you whose tears fell when you sorrowed and whose smile followed your joy i would bring him back to you but olivara is dead dead at the hands of a craven assassin the speaker turned and gazed boldly into the carriage of the president his arm remained extended aloft as if to sustain his peroration the president was listening aghast at this remarkable address of welcome he was sunk back upon his seat trembling with rage and dumb surprise his dark hands tightly gripping the carriage cushions half rising he extended one arm toward the speaker and shouted a harsh command at captain cruz the leader of the flying hundred sat on his horse immovable with folded arms giving no sign of having heard losada sank back again his dark features distinctly paling who says that olivara is dead suddenly cried the speaker his voice old as he was sounding like a battle trumpet his body lies in the grave but to the people he loved he has bequeathed his spirit yes more his learning his courage his kindness yes more his youth his image people of anchuria have you forgotten ramon the son of olivara cronin and vincenti watching closely saw dicky maloney suddenly raise his hat tear off his shock of red hair leap up the steps and stand at the side of general pilar the minister of war laid his arm across the young man's shoulders all who had known president olivara saw again his same lion-like pose the same frank undaunted expression the same high forehead with the peculiar line of the clustering crisp black hair general pilar was an experienced orator he seized the moment of breathless silence that preceded the storm citizens of anchuria he trumpeted holding aloft the keys to casa morena 
I am here to deliver these keys, the keys to your homes and liberty, to your chosen president. Shall I deliver them to Enrico Olivares' assassin, or to his son? Olivara, Olivara, the crowd shrieked and howled. All vociferated the magic name, men, women, children, and the parrots. And the enthusiasm was not confined to the blood of the plebs. Colonel Rocas ascended the steps and laid his sword theatrically at young Ramon Olivares' feet. Four members of the cabinet embraced him. Captain Cruz gave a command, and twenty of El Ciento Huillando dismounted and arranged themselves in a cordon about the steps of Casa Morena. But Ramon Olivares seized that moment to prove himself a born genius and politician. He waved those soldiers aside and descended the steps to the street. There, without losing his dignity or the distinguished elegance that the loss of his red hair brought him, he took the proletariat to his bosom, the barefooted, the dirty, Indians, Caribs, babies, beggars, old, young, saints, soldiers, and sinners. He missed none of them. While this act of the drama was being presented, the scene-shifters had been busy at the duties that had been assigned to them. Two of Cruz's dragoons had seized the bridle reins of Losada's horses. Others formed a close guard around the carriage, and they galloped off with the tyrant and his two unpopular ministers. No doubt a place had been prepared for them. There are a number of well-barred stone apartments in Coralio. "'Rouge winds,' said Mr. Vincenti, calmly lighting another cigar. Captain Cronin had been intently watching the vicinity of the stone steps for some time. "'Good boy!' he exclaimed suddenly, as if relieved. "'I wondered if he was going to forget his Kathleen Mavournin.' Young Olivara had reascended the steps and spoken a few words to General Pilar. Then that distinguished veteran descended to the ground and approached Pasa, who still stood, wonder-eyed, where Dickie had left her. With his plumed hat in his hand and his medals and decorations shining on his breast, the general spoke to her and gave her his arm, and they went up the stone steps of the Casa Morena together. And then Ramon Olivara stepped forward and took both her hands before all the people. And while the cheering was breaking out afresh everywhere, Captain Cronin and Mr. Vincenti turned and walked back toward the shore where the gig was waiting for them. "'There will be another Presidente Proclamada in the morning,' said Mr. Vincenti, musingly. "'As a rule they are not as reliable as the elected ones, but this youngster seems to have some good stuff in him. He planned and maneuvered the entire campaign. Olivara's widow, you know, was wealthy. After her husband was assassinated she went to the States and educated her son at Yale.' The Vesuvius Company hunted him up, and backed him in the little game. "'It's a glorious thing,' said Cronin, half-jestingly, "'to be able to discharge a government, and insert one of your own choosing, in these days.' "'Oh, it is only a matter of business,' said Vincenti, stopping and offering the stump of his cigar to a monkey that swung down from a lime-tree. "'And this is what moves the world of to-day. That extra real on the price of bananas had to go.' We took the shortest way of removing it. End of chapter 15 Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America